Uh, announcement this week that the Retro Tink 4K is going to retail for $750. Uh, that's sort of hot on the heels of um, prior announcements from Mike Chi that it could be anything up to a thousand. So I say this, you know, obviously better than uh, the worst case scenario. Uh, going to go to you, obviously, on this one, John, since I think you've actually got the device. Um, but the question is this, first of all, um, what is the RetroTINK 4K? Why is it this elite tier scaler? And is $750 a good price? Hmm. Uh, so the retro, basically this, the RetroTINK um, 4K is a part of a new generation of scalers that have been arriving. Um, we've also just seen the sort of announcement and release of the OSSC Pro which yep. is not quite on par with these new 4K scalers. There's also the Pixel FX Morph, which I've seen in person back at Gamescom. Uh, mm -hmm. But the RetroTINK 4K, and I don't know enough about those other ones yet to judge, but the RetroTINK 4K is focused specifically on providing the highest possible fidelity and flexibility uh, for all manner of inputs. And the idea here is that you plug in, it's not just about re old retro consoles, it's about anything. It's about PCs, it's about more modern HD consoles that are perhaps not like modern HD resolutions. Taking those signals, interpreting them using a variety of options that you have full control over and making them look exceptional on a 4K display. That is the, that's the end goal, right? So whether you're plugging in like a Super NES, uh, a retro Pentium PC, or like a an Xbox 360 playing games at 720p, this is going to help a lot. And part of yeah. that comes from the flexibility you have over how the image itself is scaled. For HD stuff, it's pretty simple. I just want crystal clear scaling, which in this case, it supports nearest neighbor upscaling. So you can take a 720p source and bring it up to 4K and it multiplies by exact numbers in each direction with no filtering. So you end up with these razor sharp pixels that honestly I think look great because with the way TVs work these days, designed mostly for video content, you plug in a 720p, like a PS3 or a 360, they look pretty bad. They're very blurry, right? It's just like yeah. the typical scaled blurred upscaling. This solves mm -hmm. that. This also supports, you know, classic retro PC resolutions, obviously, which is a big deal for Alex and I, where anything from random 70 hertz modex DOS stuff, the variable resolutions that these video cards can run at, the variable refresh rates that they can run at, uh, and this device does support things like VRR to help with that, by the way. Uh, it can accept all of this and beautifully upscale it to 4K, uh, and there's a lot of... You can do it automatically, but it can, which is really nice. But you can also customize it and dial in, you know, your your front porch and all that kind of stuff. If you remember those settings, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so that's really nice. And then, of course, older consoles. This is something the RetroTINK 5X already did very well, and that's kind of what that was designed for. This takes that, but goes even further in terms of the adjustable options which then feeds into one of the main benefits, which is the extremely flexible CRT simulation features, where this time with 4K resolution worth of pixels, uh, Mike is able to essentially create a device that can simulate the sub-pixels or like the individual phosphor elements. So like the red, green, and blue elements of the phosphors in a variable configuration as well, because not every phosphor screen has the same exact look you could say, depending on the type of screen it is, the way the phosphors uh, appear when lit, whether it's like a a Trinitron style or a, or a shadow mask tube, they have different properties. You can simulate this on the tank. But then mm -hmm. it goes even further because it supports things like HDR. You can take what these these masks, they fill the screen with a lot of darker edges, right? Because it's simulating these individual elements that dims the image a little bit because you're basically cutting off light black, to man. those pixels, right? Uh, because of HDR now, you can bump up the level of brightness output on an HDR screen, which sort of mitigates that brightness drop. And you can even simulate a little bit of like the blooming and the blurring and tweak it to really look more like a real CRT. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean you get the all the benefits of CRT, like the motion clarity by default. You know, you still have to 
deal with whatever your TV can support. Uh, but it gets a lot closer and it can even be used for high resolutions. You can even do a, uh, like for 720p, you can do like an LCD sub pixel kind of filter that replicates the pixel grid of a lower resolution panel on your 4k display which really makes it look basically like a native 720p uh or 1080p you can do the same thing it's that's extremely fun. cool yeah, um, it is ironic that the 720p generation of consoles were never actually played on 720p displays <laughs> yeah uh, the you, horror the, the only exception would be if you had like one of those dlp rear projection sets or a dlp projector those were sold often at 1280 by 720 but most displays back then were like 1366 by 768 or something right yeah mm -hmm. uh so there was always scaling happening so well, basically you made the case yeah. i think you made the case of what of what this thing could do which is that it's basically a god tier scaler that could work with basically any source that you care to throw at it from you know anything up to 4k right 4K yeah 60. and it it does 4k 60 but you can also output 4k one or sorry not 4k 120 but you can do 1080p 120 and maybe slightly higher at 120 why would you want to do that well that's because it has its own black frame insertion feature built in that was carefully tuned and derived from the work of uh, mark from blur busters mm. uh so, which of course is the king of of everything <laughs> uh blur, blur related on modern displays right so you can off you can experience that as well which is it's actually very effective it looks really really great so yeah yeah i mean we yeah. had a big bunch of supporter questions sure. here Bring them because on. In, in actual fact there were more questions for this than any other topic <laughs> uh, even more than the playstation portal which i think is quite remarkable this one from guy <laughs> mendez greetings df crew exclamation point i have a question for john with the official announcement the price of 750 dollars for retro 4k uh, can you say if it's a must for com cons customers with 4k displays i've seen mike saying the rt 4k is more of a device intended for professional use with pristine capture as a must and that the standard RT 5X 5X Pro pretty much covers all the bases for the regular users. Uh, but I don't know, am I truly missing something by not budgeting for the steep price of the RT 4K? Well, I think that depends entirely on your use case, kind of as Mike suggests. If you're just here to upscale your, your Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis or Super NES to look okay on your modern screen, the 5X, I think, gets the job done just fine. Uh, obviously, Does it do the nearest neighbor scaling? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All the scaling is mm -hmm. good. It's just it maxes out at 1440p, maybe, okay. I think. So it's lower maximum resolution, and it lacks some of the more advanced features, obviously. And it can't. It does CRT stuff, but not nearly to the same quality as the 4K. Uh, where the 4K really comes into effect is when you increase the breadth of devices that you want to use with it. Uh, like I've said, prior HD consoles, even recent ones like the Switch actually benefits a lot from this thing. If you're just sending a native uh, or near scaled 1080p signal to your 4K screen, it makes things look a lot sharper on the Switch as well, right? Yeah. So it's good for any of those types of devices. Uh, I think having a VGA input's also nice, uh, whether it's for retro PC use or things like a Dreamcast on various of the devices that might have VGA. It's basically like expanding the functionality to include all these other types of inputs while then giving you more granular control and more options for making it look really great on your screen. So if you want maximum image quality, uh, if you have other devices besides just this typical, you know, mid nineties and older retro consoles, especially, uh, this is absolutely the way to go. Okay, uh, this one from Ferdinand. I'm always hearing about the great retro tink upscalers usable for every retro console and very expensive, but are there console specific upscalers that do a good job without costing as much as a modern GPU? Absolutely. I guess, well, there's, well, I guess there is, yeah. So it varies a little bit depending on the console, but um, basically the Pixel FX line of, of, I think it's the Retro Gem it's called, is a really great product that I can recommend. And that thing works in PlayStation, PlayStation 2. Uh, it works in Dreamcast and N64. And I think that's what it supports currently. 
And those, mm. and I, they're continuing to work on this product and other similar products to offer that for other consoles. I hope one day we get an Xbox version because, man, that would be killer. Yeah, uh, but basically what that is, that's an internal mod that provides HDMI output. But the benefit there, and I even combine this with the RetroTink now <laughs> for maximum <laughs> oh, yeah. quality. But what this is, is it taps it directly into the board. So it's pulling the digital signal off the main board of these consoles and then yeah. now putting that over HDMI. So it bypasses all analog uh, video issues. So you get absolutely per pixel pristine video quality out of it. But that one, those do not support actual 4K output, though. They look awesome even at 1080p, but that's why if you feed it into something like the Tink 4K, you can take that perfect, like, non-analog HDMI output and just drop it into the Tink, and you get this perfectly scaled 4K image you can manipulate, and it's just, hmm. it's supreme. I did this for Tom, actually, for his Metal Gear video, um, where I captured Metal Gear Solid two and three at 480p on playstation 2 because using the retro uh, sorry using the retro gem on the ps2 you can actually so i forced 480p on those games uh using the uh homebrew memory card i guess the free make boot loader and then because it outputs within a certain canvas size those games have a slightly narrow pixel aspect ratio the retro gem can actually adjust for that and you can fix the aspect ratio without really any sort of visual compromise so uh mm. all of this stuff works really well together but if you just have those specific consoles that's a good option <clears throat> i think mike himself built some some cables that that were then used from retro retro gaming cables uk actually makes them where they have the old retro the older original 480p output like the line doubling retro tink features built into the cable that's crazy. So you basically just plug that into the back of like a Super NES or something and you can get like HDMI output out of that, you know, and it's lined up to 480p. So you're not going to get all the sharp, nice scaling, but it is a digital. It's not all digital because it's still pulled from the analog port, but you get some nice image quality. Better than nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look at this question. And it is from uh, Johnny5A, Johnny underscore 5A, sorry. He is alive. A lot of updates on new retro upscalers lately, but having trouble figuring out equivalent capabilities. Is OSSC Pro equivalent to RetroTink 5X? And how is RetroTink 4K better? Also curious on how motion adaptive deinterlacing actually works. Ah, so, okay. Um, so the, the OSSC Pro is something I have not tested yet, but based on everything that I've seen, it does not support 4K output like the RetroTINK 4K, uh, but it does still have things like VGA import uh, input and plenty of other nice options. It has 120 hertz with black frame insertion, it looks like. Okay. Um, from what I can tell, it seems to occupy this sort of middle ground between the Retro Tink 5X and then the Tink 4K, where it has some of the features you get on the 4K, but uh, more features than the Tink 5X. Mm. And of course, you know, the OSSC was a legendary device that was one of the first, like, absolutely open uh, solutions for this problem beyond the old Frame Meisters from Mecomsoft, right? So I actually, I, I'm very curious about the OSSC Pro. I think I would still prefer the Tink 4K based on its higher set of features, but the Pro looks really great. Uh, I'm also curious about the Pixel FX Morph. Uh, we still don't know when that will hit. That also supports 4K output and seems much more uh, closer to the Tink 4K, although I don't think it's using, I, I don't know. I, I need to wait to see more on that one as well. Okay. But mm -hmm. at least the point is, there's a lot of options out there. Yeah. Okay, we'll have to do some sort of group test at some point, I think. Um, here's a question from, and a last question from some guy person. Uh, regarding the RetroTINK 4K, TV broadcasters are famously still using 720p and 1080i as their broadcast resolution, and basically everything uses bilinear upscaling to bump it up to 4K. Could the RetroTINK 4K make that upscale better and be an essential addition for people who watch live sports? Thanks again, exclamation point. Sounds like it does to me, but you'd need an external box, right, John? Yeah, so I think the only limitation there is how you feed it into the TINK 4K um, cause I'd imagine some of these like cable boxes or whatever, uh, they have HDCP 
enabled, I would think. Mm -hmm. Right now, if, right, it's a good if point. You, yeah, if you still have a box that has like component output, uh, I think my dad has one of those <laughs> where it's you know you can still get 720p 1080i over component video. That's not HDCP encoded, obviously, because it's not HDMI, and you can pipe that directly into a Tink 4K without any fuss. With an HDMI box, though, that might not work, but there are obviously ways around that. Uh, it would have been nice if these devices could bypass HDCP, I know, but, you know, yeah. these guys don't want to get sued. Let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they HDCP, could. So they've, oh. they've got to implement HDCP for that reason. Okay. Yeah, it all sounds fair enough. Well, I guess we're going to have to take a look at this box at some point because it just sounds phenomenal. 